Uh, good evening, everybody. And yesterday, I just gave you a brief overview, if you remember, uh, what actually happens uh, in terms of illuminated manuscripts in, uh, in Germany, in the German lands. That means actually in, in the southern part of Germany, because that's really where it all happens. I showed you the first manuscript, which was the, or the earliest manuscript, which was the Bible a, a copy of the Bible commentary by Rashi. Um, and uh, leads us to Würzburg in Franconia. So the, the, the interesting thing is that despite the fact that the Schum communities are a cultural center, the tradition of, of manuscript illumination doesn't start here. It starts somewhere else. So we are in the northern part of where we actually walk around or travel around in, in Franconia. Uh, then I showed you several other examples uh, from around the year uh, 1300. Um, that is really a flourishing period of, uh, of manuscript illumination, of, of Hebrew manuscript illumination. I showed you Haggadot, I showed you Bibles, I showed you uh, Machzorim, which is pretty much the main genres that actually um, are illuminated throughout that period. And then towards the end of the session, and what I didn't manage to finish because I never get around my time, um, I started to talk a little bit because I think this is an interesting subject and, and it should be brought up because uh, um, it was brought up for years in virtually every publication on medieval Jewish art, and that's the subject of figural uh, representation. And for years, for decades actually, ever since um, there was an interest in manuscript illumination, in Hebrew Jewish manuscript illumination, the question was how does this go hand in hand with the halakha? And I believe, and that's why I want to bring it up, that it has not much to do with the halakha. It has to do with other things. So I brought you just two texts that I find significant and I find representative, uh, and, that, and, and both these texts actually uh, tell you more or less what it is all about in terms of the halakha. The first observation was that um, a work of art is um, okay, okay, not much more, but it's okay, as lo even if it's sculpted, as long as it is not worshipped. And by that, the Mishnah or Rabban Gamliel, uh, precisely, meant not just worshipped by Jews, but worshipped by anybody. Uh, a, a sculpture that is worshipped by Romans is, is not, nothing for Jews. Um, what could actually Jews do with it? Jews, of course, wouldn't put it in a, in, in, in a temple or something, but Jews could probably enjoy it, put it in their living room and just um, have fun with it. They can earn money from it, they could uh, sell it, they could buy it, and they could do all sorts of things. Uh, they call it noi, or just, um, they call it, or they, they refer to it like, take a benefit from it, some sort of benefit, aesthetic, economic, uh, but they don't even consider worship an option. So you can do that with the work of art as long as it is not worship. The other observation that the second text um, uh, teaches us is that they made a very clear distinction between two-dimensional art and three-dimensional art. Two-dimensional art is not a problem because Roman idols, Greek idols, Canaanite idols, they were all three-dimensional. They were objects, they were idols, they were sculptors. Whereas a flat picture on the wall is not a problem. So, uh, that's what happens in the third century. We find the synagogue of Duro Europos. I already mentioned that. And, um, and they don't seem to have any problem with it. It's a flat, it's flat two-dimensional murals. And uh, that pretty much actually uh, goes together with the saying about the seal ring that you can use as long as the image is sunken in and it's not protruding. The third observation to be made, and that is that whatever the halakha says, and the halakha explicitly says that two-dimensional is okay, but whatever the halakha says, there were periods the Jews did not use figural art after all. And the question is why? 
And the question is obviously has not to do with the halakha, because the halakha is, according to the halakha, it's, it's okay. So there must be other reasons. There must be other reasons for either not using figural art or using figural arts. And I believe the reasons are actually have to do with the way the Jews interact, interact with their environment, what they know about their environment, um, and they also often act like their environment, and they are familiar with their environment. That's why. And they also sometimes take issue, political issues, with the environment. So, for example, in times when the Roman emperor wants to put a statue in the temple, they're touchy about it. They're touchy about art, and then they take a distance, and that's what happens approximately during the first century. When it comes to the Islamic period in the Middle East, in Egypt, Northern Africa, um, there's a very rich uh, tradition of Hebrew illuminated manuscripts, and they're all aniconic. There's no figural art in them at all, nothing. 10th century, 11th century, and that goes up to Iberia, in the, in the, also in the Middle Ages, of course. And the first reaction is, of course, yes, all of a sudden, the halakha matters. All of a sudden, the second commandment, you shall not make an image, it actually matters. But in fact, it doesn't really, because Maimonides, who is probably the most important halachic authority of this entire period when, when, Jews, when the majority of Jews lived under Islam, he says explicitly, and what is important is at the end, it is forbidden to make images. Okay, that's what Exodus says, okay? It is forbidden to make images for the sake of beauty even, even though they are not to be used for idolatry. So he seems to be, at the first sight, at first sight he seems to be very stringent because it is said in the Bible, you shall not make with me any graven image. This prohibition, he says, includes even images of silver and gold, which are made only for beauty, lest those who worship idols be misled by them and think they are for purposes of idolatry. However, this prohibition against fashioning images for beauty applies only to the human form, and therefore we do not fashion any human form in wood, in plaster, or in stone. That is, we don't make sculptures. This holds when the form projects like the murals and paneling in a reception hall, and he means reliefs. If one fashions these, he should be punished. However, if the form is sunken or of a medium like that of images on panels or tables, table, tablets or those woven in fabrics, it is permitted. And that he says in uh, Mishne Torah. So actually, Despite that Maimonides says clear and undoubtedly that uh, painted images are uh, permitted, Jews under Islamic culture do not use any figural painting. So this is obviously not to do with the uh, halakha. So with what, um, what, what could actually possibly be the reason? The reason, I believe, is that around the sixth century, uh, or probably even somewhat earlier, Jews became aware that Christians actually worship also images. But this time, these are not sculptures. These are icons. These are flat paintings. And then they got confused. So what we actually observe is that around the 6th century, there's no figural Jewish art up to the 13th century. Nothing. Nowhere. And there will never be any figural art up to the 16th century in Byzantium, where um, uh, the worship of icons is, in particular, uh, is particularly uh, popular, of course, and, and you know all that. So, halakha is one thing, but when, Christ when Jews uh, became aware that Christians actually worship painted images, uh, then they take a distance and they don't use any of this. Uh, in Islam, it's the same thing. In Islam, they just do what their, you know, Islamic, or their Muslim neighbors do. Muslim neighbors don't use any art in a religious context, so they do the same. They have beautiful carpet pages, so they paint carpet pages. Around 
the 12th, late 12th, late 11th or early 12th century, all of a sudden, Rashi, whom we already met in some other context, um, all of a sudden discovers and says so. They talk about, you know, the rabbis, they talk about, um, so how, how do you interact with Christian? When do you can have some economic relationship? What do you do when you meet them on the market? And so on. So what, what, what the, the, the plan is, the context is how you regulate life with Christians in, you know, daily life, daily life in the, in the French city. So they talk about, are the Christians idolaters or are they not? If they are idolaters, then we should treat them in some way. And if they're not idolaters, then we can have other regulations. So the tendency is, after all, the Christians, they worship the Trinity. It's not just one God exactly. I mean, it is probably one God. It is, according to Christian belief, it's one God, but it's still three persona. Then, uh, and they also have icon worship. So how can they not be idolaters? So the tendency is uh, to, 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 to look at Christians, to refer to Christians as idolaters. And then Rashi all of a sudden says, Gentiles, he says, Rashi, Gentiles of our times, the Christians that is, you know, after all we are in France, 11th century, Gentiles of our times are no longer knowledgeable, knowledgeable as far as the veneration of idols is concerned. So what he observes in 11th century France is that they don't do it right. They don't actually use, they don't actually work, worship icons. They forgot how to do that. That's why he's a little belittling. He says, they're not knowledgeable. Hem lo adukim They don't know what they're talking about. And then about 100 years later, a little less than 100 years later, another rabbi across the Rhine, Eliezer Benatan says, he gives it some precision here. He says the same thing, Gentiles of our time are no longer knowledgeable as far as the veneration of idols is concerned. And then he adds, however, in Russia and in the lands of Greece, they are certainly skilled in idolatry as they put objects of idolatry on all their gates, on all their doors, in their houses and on the walls of their houses. So he figured out in the Rhineland that um, in Russia and in Greek, Orthodox, Byzantines, they do worship icons, but in France and in Germany, they don't. So we have to actually can have a different set of regulations um, in terms of our contacts with, with, the, with the neighbors uh, than, for example, would apply in Russia or in Greek. So what I'm trying to say here is that the Jews are certainly familiar with how their neighbors acted, also in terms of their religion, and also in terms of how they treat icons. So what I think, that once they figured out, they don't say so explicitly, I have to admit, but once they figure out that in France and in Germany, Christians don't worship icons, and they didn't, I mean, not to the same extent as in Russia and in Greece, for, uh, in any case, um, okay, then we can actually have figural art again. I mean, they don't probably put it these words, but, um, you know, they see they're Christians, they have beautiful books, they have embellished books, they have decorated books, and they don't worship them, so why shouldn't we be able to use them? So that's what I mean, the Jews react, uh, by saying the Jews react to their environment, and then um, in accordance to what they see and how they perceive of what they see, they... Um, can use um, figural art or not. And then since the 13th century, all over, you know, Central Europe, and this comes back also to Spain, um, we have a great wealth of, uh, of figural art everywhere where Jews actually live. And then there's one more thing about figural art, and then I'll stop and I'll give you some examples. And that is a text uh, by Rabbi Meir Ben Baruch, as far as the question of my master is concerned, that's, the, that's the, the, the question, about forms of animals and birds in our prayer books, and he calls them hamachzurim shelanu. You are surprised that I do not object to them, 
since it has been taught in the Mechilta, you shall not make for yourself a sculpted image, he shall not make one that is engraved, but perhaps he may make one that is solid. Scripture says, nor in the manner of likeness, even not a large animal, a small animal, fowl or fish, not even reflections and fragments, etc. So somebody is bothered by these machzorim. And he even mentions only animals and birds, not human. But anyway, he doesn't like them. And so, by the way, did the pietists. They also didn't like him. They say so explicitly, but I'll come back to that point later on. So he answers, Rabbi Meir Hamharam Mirotenburg. It seems to me, he says, that these people who produce or use these prayer books are not acting properly. He's not happy. Since when they look at these forms, they do not concentrate on their father who is in heaven during prayer. So it's all about concentration. It's all about kavanah. But, he says, however, there is no prohibition in this case. You know, the halakha has nothing to do with it, he says. You should not make yourself a sculpted image. does not apply here. Because we conclude from the chapter all the images in the Mishnah, called Tzlamim, which is the third chapter of the of tractate Abu Dazara. So we conclude from that chapter that it is different as in the case of Rabban Gamliel, and he te- teaches us now what we read yesterday, um, where, we, where we learned that others made for him images. As far as paintings are concerned, there is not even a suspicion of, transre- of transgression because they are just made of colors and there is no real substance in them. So he says that these paintings in the Machzorim are not a problem in terms of halakha, but they shouldn't be there because actually if you use a prayer book with paintings, you don't, you don't listen to the, to the prayers and you're not concentrated, you have no kavana, and your prayer will not reach God. So that's his point. So that's a whole different story. By the way, uh, this uh, idea also comes up... Um, um, uh, on the part of some Christian theologians, uh, the Cistercians, for example, Bernard de Clairvaux, says exactly the same thing. He, you know, he, he, talks, about, he talks about sculpted um, capitals in cloisters uh, where, the, where the monks uh, walk around and are supposed to meditate, and then all they see is monsters and hybrids and, and, and monkeys and all sort of, and, and he lists them all. He definitely looked at them very carefully. So he says, no, this is really uh, not so good for meditation, and um, they shouldn't be there. And we all know that Cistercians, um, at least in the beginning, uh, don't use a lot of art. And then at the end he says, Meir doesn't say that, but at the end he says, and if you think that this is okay, these sculpted images, don't you shrink from the expenses? This is also a Cistercian idea. You know, okay, maybe it's okay from the point of view of the law, but it's so expensive, don't waste your money on these stupid monkeys and hybrids and so on. So that's what ha- so again, I think that Rabbi Meir had some idea about what the Cistercians were thinking. Um, so what I'm trying to say here is that uh, Jews were culturally definitely not isolated and they knew what their neighbors thought and saw and perceived of and so on. So that much uh, to the issue of figural painting. And now I would like to return to this very area. Um, unfortunately, the Shum communities are not extremely rich in um, book illumination, uh, but one of the most beautiful books that I've spent some seven years with um, not too long ago uh, was made here, not far from here, somewhere in, in Worms. And um, so that's why I'm going to focus on it. Another book is this um, Bird Heart Sagada, which I already showed you yesterday, which is the earliest, actually, individual Haggadah, the earliest book Haggadah uh, that came down to us that, that has some illumination. Um, I already mentioned those bird heads uh, briefly yesterday. I don't want to go into this subject because it's a very vexed subject. And, 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 and this particular Haggadah, was written, as you probably can figure out, by a certain Menachem, 
Uh, Haggadot usually don't have colophons, that is, they don't have signatures, so we don't know who made them, and we don't know, normally, not always, but normally we don't know who made them, we don't know for whom they were made, neither where and when, which of course gives a lot of challenges to art historians, but uh, we usually don't know anything about all these things. So the, Vogel, the, the Birdhead's Haggadah has a tiny little decoration here on the root of Nun Chet Mem. And the same thing happens in the Leipzig Machzor, which I'm going to show you now, only that I don't have that page. I don't have a picture of that page, but uh, there we find the same thing, the same uh, Nun Chet Mem. And the idea is, or what scholars commonly think, is that a certain Menachem was the scribe of both manuscripts. Um, who he was, we don't know. There is you know, Menachem is not a lot of information. There are many Menachems around. But uh, still, we know that a certain Menachem copied the book and apparently the same Menachem, and he also uses the same script, really, also wrote our Leipzig Machzor that we shall now focus a little bit uh, for the rest of um, this session because it's really a, a fabulous manuscript and a very interesting manuscript. So I don't have to tell you really a lot about Pew Team because Peter talked a lot about it and, and you know more or less what's actually happening, you know, when, when people read and, and, and sing and recite uh, this Pew Team. Um, one point that I would like to stress again, and in, you know, I, because I think it's particularly significant, is that the recitation of Pew Team the recitation of Putim was common everywhere. I mean, Spain is famous for its Putim. But in Ashkenaz, it became a cornerstone of their culture, especially in the Shum communities. And I think Peter has shown this quite nicely. Uh, here, it becomes a cornerstone of their tradition, of their uh, culture. It becomes an issue of identity. They, uh, it all has to do with Ashkenazi custom, which is an old custom that came from, from the land of Israel via Italy. That is the route that these Ashkenazi Jews took in the early Middle Ages. So this custom comes all the way to the Rhineland, and there they really develop it further and further and make it into a, 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 a very significant cornerstone. That it also has to do that in, in the early days, the 9th and the 10th century, they hardly knew the Babylonian Talmud. The Babylonian Talmud was known in Northern Africa and in Iberia. And then slowly, they, Ashkenazim, uh, uh, discovered under inverted comma uh, the Babylonian Talmud. And then they started to comment, on, to comment on, on it. And then the School of Worms developed and so on. But in parallel, this custom that they took from the land of Israel via Italy to, uh, to the Rhineland is really very important. I can't go into details here, but it's very important. And the recitation of Piotim is one aspect of this. One, you know, one of these customs is that they spend hours and hours on the holidays to listen to this Piotim in the synagogue. And some critics say that this takes all too long and it's too distracting but they do it, they do it um, despite uh, critique. So that's why I think also these machzorim become so um, beautifully embellished. And this Leipzig machzor, you can even see it on this page, in terms of layout and in terms of, of, of lavishness, of, of size, of everything, it's just one of the most beautiful books that uh, exist. Here you have a selection of some pages. I won't talk about all of them, um, even, if, even though it would be tempting. Uh, but that's how, more or less, um, this decoration functions. So you usually have an initial panel, which is usually the first piyut, the yotzer, the first piyut of one particular holiday. Uh, and then you have usually a decoration, uh, often uh, on the bottom margin or, some, or in, the, in, the, in the initial uh, that somehow relates to the holidays. In general, very general, and I'm taking here conclusions 
uh, from the end and say them right away. In general, this imagery has a lot to do uh, with the Ashkenazi pietists. And you have learned a lot about the Ashkenazi pietists. You learned about their ethics and their ascetic lifestyle. You learned about their mystics and their esoteric ideas. And they developed these ideas up to 1232, when Elazar of Worm dies. Worms dies. That is the heyday. These are the heydays of uh, Ashkenazi pietism. Judah the Pious dies 1217. His student Elazar of Worms dies in 1232. So these are the heydays of, German, of, 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 of Ashkenazi pietism. Now we are about 80 years apart from that. So this is not a document of the Ashkenazi pietists. The Ashkenazi pietists wouldn't have been would not have been happy about it. They didn't think that Mahzurim should be illustrated or in any form lavishly uh, or a lot of money wasted on them. This is definitely not ascetic. But what happens actually at the end of the 13th century and the beginning of the 14th century, especially in Worms, the community identity of the Worms community was all built on Elazar of Worms. He was the hero, he was the figure uh, that they, they built their identity on. He figured everywhere in the 16th century, in the 17th century still, there were um, um, you know, wonder stories, uh, all sorts of miracle stories that were told about both uh, Rabbi Yehuda Hasid, but particularly uh, Elazar of Worms. So he was, he was he was stylized into some hero of the Worms community. And what I think, because when I started to work on this book and picture, you know, image after image, I tried to figure out what happens there and, and how can this relate to the culture of the, of, 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 of the time, it always brought me back to Elazar of Worms. And then I say, wait a minute, how, how come? I mean, the pietists and art, don't go well together. Um, and then I started to learn about uh, the, the later culture of the community of Worms. And then I figured out that uh, despite the fact that the pietists were long gone for several decades, um, he was still there. He was still uh, a, a cornerstone of their identity. Not so much in terms of mysticism, because you know, these community people were not necessarily great mystics, but in terms of their traditions, in terms of their knowledge, in terms of their ethics, in terms of their halacha and so on, they uh, certainly used a great deal of his thought and of this tradition. So virtually every picture here goes, has something to do with the, the, the thoughts or the laws or the customs, very much the customs that somehow are related to Elazar of Worms. I shall show you two or three pictures, that's all, because I really want to dig deeper into this and to show, uh, to show you how this uh, functions. So, you were in Worms, you went to the synagogue, and the synagogue pretty much looked in the Middle Ages like it did uh, as you saw it. It's rebuilt, but uh, more or less it is the building. So you can imagine, you have to be mind the center, you have to uh, Arona Kodesh uh, at, the, at the eastern end. And there's a door, an entrance, and you can come in. So you just, you know, imagine yourself, you're sitting there. And then at the eve of the holiday, the Shamash comes in, this is just an illustration, and he brings the book. And this is really a sort of ritual. It's not a procession like the Christians do, but, you know, he comes, eve of the holiday, everybody's ready for the prayer, the community is assembled in a synagogue, and here he comes. He comes into the door, the door opens, he comes into the, into the sacred space of the synagogue, and then he puts this huge book, beautiful book, on the lectern, or on the Bama, I think it was a lectern, a special lectern, and there it was. And then comes the Shalir Tzibur, the Chazan, and he goes for, he goes to the, to the Bima, um, he stands there in front of the book, the book is open, you can see it. He is accompanied by two men, 
and he takes a huge tallit, an enormous tallit, and he wraps himself completely from, the, from, from, from head to, to toe almost, and he does it in a way, he wraps himself in a way that two of the fringes on two corners uh, are on the back. That's what he does. And I'll tell you why I know that that's what he does. So he wraps himself, and you see his, his hand movement, okay? You can really see him do this. He's almost shown in a, in a movement. And the other man stands behind him. The page that we see here, here at the bottom of the second um, uh, page that you don't see, starts out with Shuchen Ad Merom. Shuchen Ad Merom is the first prayer that you need a minyan. You need 10 people. You need a community. Communal prayer starts. Before that, there's mirot and all sort of things, and they wait until the community is there, and at least 10 men are around. But Shuchen Ad Merom, that's when the community is here. So that's the very moment. That's when the Shaliyah Hatzibur comes forth. So we can imagine that this is really something of a ritual. You know, he comes in, he does all this rapping, two men stand next to him, and everything is beautiful, and he starts to chant, okay? He starts to recite those beautiful piyotim that Peter uh, told us all about. So the question is now, and that was my methodology, so I'm looking at this image, and I say, okay, shaliach tzibur in a talit, fine, good enough, let's leave it there, I can do something else, I can look at another picture. But then I can ask myself, okay, what actually is the status of the Shaliyah HaTzibur in early 14th century Worms? And the answer was quite interesting, because there are two notions here, you know, two, two things. There is the Shaliyah HaTzibur, and there is the Talit, the beautiful white Talit that is so dominantly shown here, and of course the man too. So I started to look what actually these notions mean or meant ever since it started out in the late antique period. I'm going to do it shortly, don't worry, uh, uh, even though there's a, a great wealth of, of sources. So let's start. So what, what, I'm, what I was trying to do is actually to say, okay, what, is the, you know, what, what do we know about the Shadir Tzibur in, in the Talmud, in the Mishnah, in the Talmud? What do we know about them in Babylon? What do we know about them in Iberia? What do we know about them in France? And what do we know about them in Worms? So, in the Talmud, the Shadir Tzibur is an important person. He is um, a man, of course, um, older than 13. He's not a scholar. He's decent. He knows how to read. He's not a, great, not, a, not a big sinner, but he's just a common person. He's just a normal man. He's not any, you know, he doesn't have to be a rabbi. He doesn't have to be a, a, a ritual agent. That's what the, the ritual theorists uh, call it. He's just any man who knows the prayer, who knows how to pray, who knows how to read, and there he is. And that's how, in short, very briefly, the Mishnah and the Talmud actually refer to him. Um, and even if we go all the way through those areas of Jewish life that are dominated during the Middle Ages by the Babylonian Talmud, this is more or less the same thing. And there's also Chazan. There's a Chazan, and this is even a more common person. He's actually the Shamash. In the Mishnah, in the Talmud, the Chazan is the Shamash. Sometimes he sings, but he's actually the person who is, he's the attendant, who is, he's, he's the person who takes care of things, uh, and he certainly is not, not a scholar or a rabbi. And even in the 11th century, Rashi, same Rashi, says explicitly, the Chazan, he's the Shamash, the servant, the servant of the community, and I never heard that he has any significance. That's Rashi's opinion about the Chazan. So the Shadir HaTzibur is a decent man, he knows how to pray, everything is fine. The Chazan is a simple man, he's the Shamash. That's what the Babylonian tradition actually thinks about 
the shaliach had tzibur and the chazan, who are still two different things. And then all of a sudden, around here in the Rhineland, the, shamash, uh, the, 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 the shaliach had tzibur, the shatz, and the chazan become the same thing. And then it really becomes different and interesting. But before I'll get there, how about the talit? Talit actually goes, undergoes a similar development. Talit is the Jewish word, the Hebrew word for pallium. Pallium is the Latin word for a rectangle, rectangular cloth uh, that everybody in the Middle East and in Rome wore. In Greek, it's called himation. Everybody had a pallium. That was, you know, that kept you warm. You could do all, all, all sorts of things with it. You could even cover yourself at night with it. You could do, you know, it was a very practical object. Some people had expensive uh, pallia, and then they would appear um, in court, for example, with the, with the pallium. Jews also wore pallia. They called it talit. And because there is uh, the, the precedent precept of fringes, they would put four fringes on the corners that would remind them, that's what the Bible says, remind them of the Taryag, mitzvot of the 613 commandments. But it was a normal object. We read in the Mishnah endlessly, you know, you can use it, it, it it's, it's actually expensive when you have it made from wool, for example, it's an expensive object, you can use it to redeem your son at the ritual of Pidyona Ben, because it's, in, it's expensive enough. So, and, and, the, and the Mishnah and the, and the Talmud is full with just notions of, it's just an object, it's an important object, but it's an object, it's a mundane object. The talit had one function though, because everybody had a talit. When you were in the field, for example, and you were half naked because it's hot, and you were doing your, your work, and then, time of prayer comes, you're not supposed to pray naked or half naked. Uh, so you have to cover yourself. And then you have the, your talit with your stuff and you can actually use the talit and you can cover yourself and everything is fine. That was the only, actually the only religious function of the talit apart from having the four fringes. So you agree with me that this picture speaks of a different language. It speaks a different language. The talit here is something different. So when actually the talit becomes somehow something different, because when we go to early medieval northern Africa, same thing. When you go to Iberia in the Islamic period, same thing. That's what the talit is. And it, actually Maimonides, whom I mentioned already, for example, he says explicitly, somebody says, somebody asks him, I have to remember this, but uh, somebody asks my Maimonides and says, um, I'm using my talit for prayer. So this is an important object. I would like to embroider it with the name of God. And then Maimonides really uh, uh, gets very angry. And you can read between the lines how angry is. But don't do such a thing. This is just a normal object. You go to the bathroom. He says explicitly, you go to the bathroom with a talit. So don't please embroider the name of God on a talit because it's just a mantle. But then all of a sudden, imagine Paris in the 12th century and the 13th century, nobody wears any pallia anymore. Nobody wears a talit. So what do you do? People, you know, wear tailored mantles. Uh, and and, and so, so what do you do? What? And that is something that French rabbis, for example, or also Iberian rabbis, become very nervous about. What do you do? You can't walk in the street. You look strange. And they say so explicitly. You can't walk now with a talit in the street because, you know, it, 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 you, you stand out. You don't want to stand out. You don't want to be eccentric. So what do you do? Do we all give it up? Shall we say, okay, no fringes anymore? We don't need them? I mean, we are covered in prayer. That's not a problem. But don't we, know, don't we need the fringes anymore. So we are now in the 12th, 13th century. And that's exactly the point, the moment, when the talit becomes a ritual object. Because the rabbi, the rabbi says, no, we need the talit. 
We need the fringes, and that's a commandment. We can't live without a talit. So that from a mundane object of everyday life and costume, they turn it into what it actually became. But that doesn't happen necessarily in France. In France, they just say, don't give it up. That's all they say. But in the Rhineland, the rabbis of the Rhineland now make the talit into something special. And they make it into something special because, and here we can again read some texts, because they go back to the early Palestinian Midrash. The early Palestinian Midrash um, is also a very important cornerstone of Ashkenazi custom. They go a lot back to it. Some of it is also found in the Babylonian Talmud, but much of it is, is, is found in works like uh, Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer or Pesikta de Rav Kahana and, and, and uh, texts like that. So this is a, a, a very particular, very specific tradition of Midrash that was composed in in the area of the land of Israel, less so in Babylonia. And on that route that I described at the beginning from the land of Israel via Italy into the Rhineland, just here, um, these Midrashim went with, with, with the Ashkenazim and, and were part of their custom. And here we read, It's very short, I'll translate it, don't worry. This is some saying that the rabbis use a lot uh, if it refers to something strange and you wouldn't say it unless, you can say it only because it is written in the Bible. So, מלמד, but that's the important part, מלמד שנתעטף הקדוש ברוך הוא כשליח ציבור והראה לו למשה סדר תפילה. So this is no longer, this starts out, you know, as telling us, this is not just an object, it's the HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God, who wraps himself in, who wraps himself. It doesn't say in what. He wraps himself like a shaliach ציבור. And God passed by before him and called upon him. Rabbi Yochanan said, Were it not written in the text, it would be impossible for us to say such a thing. This verse teaches us that the Holy One, blessed be he, wrapped himself like a shaliach tzibur and showed Moses the order of prayer. So this has all to do with divine communication. It has all to do with the notion, just imagine yourself, God wrapping himself, very anthropomorphic, but still, it's, uh, it's, 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 you, you definitely can imagine. And then in the Pesikta de Rav Kahana, which is one of those um, early medieval Palestinian midrashim, late antique, early middle, uh, medieval, and there's a little elaboration on all this. Rabbi Chia, in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, the Holy One, blessed be he, wrapped himself in a fringed talit. So here we go, explicitly, in a fringed talit and placed Moses here and Moses there. You know, just look at the picture. And called upon Michael and Gabriel and made them, Moses and Aaron, emissaries for the beginning of the month to transmit calendric issues to remote communities. He spoke to them in this order that I show to you now. My sons shall arrange the year with an elder, with witnesses, and with a fringed talit. So what is this all about? First of all, it's all about God teaching Moses and Aaron about the calendar. The calendar is a very complicated issue. I won't talk about it, but it's definitely a very complicated issue. It is extremely complicated in the late antique and the early Middle Ages. It's a lunar calendar, and you certainly have to be taught to handle it and to reckon uh, the liturgical year. So that's what he does. God himself teaches Moses and Aaron about the calendar and how he does it. He does it while he's fringed. He teaches. Teaching is like prayer almost. You know, you don't study Torah, you don't teach Torah 
uncovered. So he covers himself, he wraps himself in a fringe talit and teaches Moses and Aaron this and there. And then we come to Eleazar of Worms. Eleazar of Worms, after all, left us a very rich corpus of all sorts of writings, among them halachic writings. And he also uses this very tradition, the same citation, several times. Two or three times I found it in his text when he mentions this notion, and now from the pietistic world, from the pietistic angle, it's even more, um, you know, imaginary. He speaks uh, two or three times about HaKadosh Baruch Hu, uh, who uh, wraps himself in a fringe talit. And then he says another thing, an additional thing. He says that um, he quotes another Midrash. He quotes a Midrash that is lost. We don't have it anymore. Amos Geula from the Hebrew University um, tried to reconstruct it, managed quite a bit. Uh, and this is called um, the Midrash of Kir. And it's also one of those somewhat esoteric uh, Palestinian midrashim that apparently were very important to the pietists. And the Midrash of Kir also brings this tradition. And then he says about, you know, people wrapping themselves in a talit. And then it says, and you throw, can zorkim, you throw two of your fringes on your back. We don't know why. He doesn't say that. And we don't even have the text. But Elazar of Worms quotes it explicitly. And he says, wrapping oneself, one throws the corners to the back, as it is written in the Midrash of Kir. He knows it. He still had it. We don't have it anymore. So, Elazar, so here we are in Worms, 1310. We have these traditions linked to Elazar of Worms. And we uh, know, you know that he was thinking of all sorts of issues about rapping and whoever raps himself in a talit is actually like God who raps himself in, uh, in a talit and teaches Moses and Aaron. And you also should do it like throwing your fringes on the back, exactly what this Shaliyah Tzibur does. And in this vicinity, in this culture of Ashkenazi pietists, and even a little earlier, but in the Rhineland, in the Middle Rhineland, the Shalir Tibur, in parallel to all this, also becomes a totally different person. He actually, first of all, Shalir and Tibur and Chazan become one and the same thing. That's why we still call the Chazan Chazan. Uh, and they are, um, come from the most important families, rabbinic families. They are usually our scholars. They usually are Paitanim. They actually compose Piyotim. Elazar of Worms, by the way, was one of them. And uh, one of the most important Paitanim um, from the Mainz Worms and Speyer region was, for example, uh, Meir, one Meir around uh, the 12th century, 11th century. And he calls himself Meir Schatz, Meir Shalir Tzibur. That's his name as, 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 uh, as a poet. So the Shalir Tzibur is not just a commoner who knows how to read and is a decent person, but he's a scholar, he's a poet, he's a rabbi, he comes from one of the most important families, he is, you know, one of the cornerstones of the Ashkenazi um, community. So I hope that um, you, you, you grasp something about how, how this functions in, in, in my view. Um, when I, you know, when I look at the picture, or when you look at the picture, you can just say, okay, from our modern point of view, what is so special about a man who wraps himself in a talit? But if you contextualize such a picture and make all that thick description that anthropologists talk about, then you actually realize that a talit is not always a talit, a shalir tzibur is not always a shalir tzibur, and then you can actually see this image in its own context and see what actually a man who comes into the synagogue of Worms sees this picture on the lectern, you know, laid out for several days during your holiday 
and what he actually thinks about this whole, this whole picture. And he sees the ritual every holiday uh, being performed. And that is actually the most uh, interesting thing. So, what else is there in the Leipzig Mahzor that can link us somehow to the world of the Pietists, to the world of uh, Eliezer, Eliezer of Worms? Another picture which um, appears uh, near the, the, the piyut, the yotzer, the first piyut uh, for the holiday of Shavuot, shows us this little scene, which is not a bit biblical scene. It shows us um, a man with a baby, not with a baby actually, it's a six-year-old boy who is wrapped in the mantle and he has a mantle, not not a talit, but he could also have a talit, actually. And he goes in the street, and then he goes to the house of the rabbi or to the synagogue. There, the rabbi waits, and then he takes the child on his lap. He gives him some tablets with letters on them, and he gives him some cookies and an egg. And there are more boys here, you know, six-year-old boys, eggs, cookies, and at the end of it all, they go, you know, when all this obviously ritual is done, they go to the river, there's no problem to find a river around here in the Rhineland, and uh, then they, they throw the eggs and the cookies there, and, you know, river, it's water, it's purity, it's, it's all sort of stuff. So, the question is, what is this all about? Now, in terms of ritual theory, you know, in anthropology, ritual theory is a very important thing. Uh, so there are all sorts of rituals, and a ritual, you know, has a, diff has a certain structure. A ritual has, um, a ritual is performed. There's, there's what they call a performance in a ritual. Ritual theorists, you know, talked, ever since they started to talk about rituals, they talk about rituals of passage, which can be, Baptism, which can be a bar mitzvah today, modern times, not so much actually uh, in the Middle Ages. There was a bar mitzvah, and at the age of 13, you were obliged to, to, uh, to, to, to um, um, keep the precepts. But there was, no, there was no ritual, there was no ceremony like, like today. There was this ceremony. Year, you know, six, uh, age of six, the child, the boy, goes first time into the school and starts schooling. He starts studying. So this is a ritual of passage which actually got lost. Uh, we, we, we don't, you know, nobody... There are some, here and there, are some communities that still remember it uh, because later it ended up in Northern Africa. But, you know, this is... I believe you never really uh, have anybody seen doing it. Uh, but in the... 13th century, in the 12th and 13th century, and, and for a longer period, up to the probably 15th or 16th, we certainly have this ritual, minhagavutenu, who says, minhagavutenu, a custom of our fathers, of our forefathers, you know? I told you at the beginning, custom in the Ashkenazi communities is the most important thing. So it's a minhagavuteno, so you have to do this. Minhagavuteno shemoshivin hatinukot lilmod Torah beshavuot. You know, this is the holiday of Shavuot. This piyut is for Shavuot. Minhagavuteno shemoshivin hatinukot lilmod beshavuot lefi shenitna bo Torah remes shemechasin. Yeah, remes. What is the remes? What is the hint? He says. You take, the, you take the boy into school to start to teach, to, to study Torah. Why? Because it is the, the, it is the holiday of Shavuot, and on the holiday of Shavuot, the Torah was given to the Israelites. What you have here on the opposite page, uh, because this is the real beginning of the Piyot, you have uh, uh, another illumination of Moses showing the Israelites the Ten Commandments, which is actually the whole Torah according to the Jewish tradition, and uh, shows them, um, you know, the precepts. So here you have it all. You have to, the, the mythical aspect of the ritual is here on the right side, and the performative aspect of the ritual is here on the left side. So you have how to do it and why to do it, you know? 
what, what the tradition says, why to do it. So he explains, Elazar, you know, min ha'gavutenu shemoshimim atinu kol kilmod b'shabuot, lefi nitna bo Torah, because the Shabuot, the Torah was given. Ve'az um, omer, ve'mechasin ha'na'ar, mechasin et ha'na'ar, um, and by that, according to other sources, it could either be a talit or uh, a mantle. You know, you cover the boy. So that, 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 he, that, that he won't see a dog. A dog is, is, is bad luck. Uh, other sources say uh, that they don't see Gentiles or the Gentiles don't see the boy. You actually cover him completely. He's not supposed to see anything because he still is unlearned. So what does this all mean? He comes out of his home, of his life so far with his mother, um, where he didn't go out of the house. He was protected. He was you know, within the vicinity of the home, and now he gets out into the world. That is all what a, uh, a ritual of passage is, is, is all about. So he's covered, um, and it, uh, 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 the father takes him uh, to the rabbi. You know, the, the first day, uh, on the day that they educate him, that is, on the first day that they start to educate him in the Otiyot HaKodesh, to teach him the sacred letters. As he says, Mevi'im hana'arim al sham biyot ha-boker v'yeh kolot u'brakim d'hainu ma'amad har Sinai. So what he compares all this, you know, you bring the boy and it is like ma'amad har Sinai. It is like the uh, transmission of the law on the Mount of Sinai. And so on and so on. So he explains all this. I want to cut it short so that we still have time for, for questions, if you wish. And, uh, and, and, and then he explains that um, uh, the, 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 the rabbi sits there. He has these uh, little tablets uh, that you use for, for schooling and for teaching. Uh, he had... He had covered them with, with, with honey, and the boy can now lick the honey, so, you know, study is going to be really sweet, and then he gets cookies uh, made out of honey, and some sources tell that uh, the cookies have letters on them, and then he gets an egg, and the egg has letters on them, and he kind of swallows in those letters. He swallows in what is written on these little tablets that he's going to study, and it's all very sweet, and it's all like honey, and, and so on and so on. So it's a real kind of mystical ritual that teaches the boy to swallow in, to take in as much as he can uh, the, the Torah into, an, into, his, into, his, uh, you know, into his soul, into his belly, into everything. Um, this ritual is, is, is documented in, in several sources um, that somehow are related to this vicinity of the, of the Ashkenazi pietists. Um, and was, um, as Ivan Marcus, who studied the ritual in great detail, uh, assumes uh, common until the 15th, 16th, until the, the early modern period when the famous bar mitzvah became more of a, um, more of a uh, common ritual and then it was somehow uh, forgotten. So why, why is this all so important? Why, why did they, you know, why this machzor becomes, you know, this object, this ritual object in the middle of the synagogue, on the bima, on a lectern, and everybody sees it. It's, it's the most public art that you can get. I talked about this yesterday. So why is it so important? It's a communal object. I started out with how important the prayer was for the community. The first picture documents that uh, you can start when, when the minyan is assembled and when this becomes a community uh, uh, ritual. Ritual theorists and anthropologists believe, some of them believe, others don't, but some of them believe, that rituals are something that builds communities, that builds communities and builds cohesion among the members of the communities. And when does it do so? It does so 
when it becomes dangerous even more. I mean, communities is always very important and you know, people gather in communities. There is no, you know, some people say that one of the problems of our modern times or postmodern times is that we don't gather enough in communities. But, so there's always communal life. But cohesion among the members of the communities becomes ever more important when life is shaky and when the community starts to crumble apart and uh, when danger uh, becomes, or when, when the community becomes alert to danger. So for example, one of these anthropologists says, a ritual, a liturgical rite may explicitly mediate contact with the divine while simultaneously rehearsing to participants in the community's value system covering over potential sources of conflict in the community and consolidating the power structure operative in the community by associating it with the sacred and thus the unquestionable. So you install, you, 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 you invent, you, you create, you develop rituals in order to keep the community together. And other anthropologists uh, speak uh, uh, specifically about dangers and the community of worms in the beginning of the 14th century certainly felt that it was in danger. We are just a few years, eight or 10 years, after one of the massive, probably actually the first massive wave, waves of, of persecution in the area. Worms itself was not affected but communities at the distance of 20 or 30 kilometers certainly were. And I'm talking about um, a series of pogroms that took place in the summer of 1298 um, and were commonly uh, called by, uh, by, uh, by, uh, by the people of the period and also in, in the literature, uh, the Rindfleisch pogroms. Rindfleisch was one of the leaders who uh, started it all out. Now, why is this important? Uh, because in the Leipzig Machzor, we find an image of Abraham, of a very famous midrash, Abraham in the furnace of Nimrod. Now, I'm not going to tell you all about this midrash. It's one of the most, mostly read midrashim. It's all about Abraham discovering that there is one God, uh, his father, who is actually uh, a producer of idols, you know, back then in, 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 in Mesopotamia, he uh, turns him in. He turns him in uh, to Nimrod because in, in the eyes of Nimrod, the king, uh, this, is, this is blasphemy. Um, and so there is, a, there is a trial. And in the end of the trial, Abraham is put into, into a fiery furnace. And of course, he's saved by an angel or, angel or by God himself. That's the story. You probably all know it. It's a very famous story, and it comes in, in several different versions. So then this appears here uh, in the Leipzig Machzor. It appears near a piyut, which actually doesn't have to be illustrated, but it is. So this is an important subject. They really want to paint it. And the piyut uh, starts out, etan hikir emunatcha, the one who is steadfast in his faith, which of course is very nice, goes very nicely with Abraham. And indeed, Eitan, this Eitan, which is also a name, is a kind of a synonym in the Talmudic literature uh, for Abraham. So this period is all about Abraham's steadfast, firm belief. And the picture is down there. The period doesn't mention the Midrash, the period mentions the bending of Isaac. But they choose to show here Abraham in the fiery furnace for all sorts of reasons. Reasons I'm not going to go into all those reasons. One of the reasons is, and before probably I'll explain you, just a brief look at the picture. Two thirds of it is occupied with the trial not with the furnace. The furnace is the most important thing in the story, but not here. Here, it's a king, you know, a Gothic king, like the French king or somebody, sitting here on the throne-like seat. And then Terach, Abraham's father, who is turning him in, Abraham and his brother. And then here, there's not a furnace, there's a stake. There's a stake 
where Abraham is found and the hand of God um, saves him. So, 12 years earlier or 10 years earlier, this story happens not far from here in the town of Röttingen, uh, which actually this story was the first beginning, the actual beginning of these Rindfleisch persecutions. A Jew was believed to get hold of the holy host, and he did all sort of things with the holy host. He sold, uh, there was a Christian who sold it to him, and you know all these stories, I don't have to tell them to you. The story ends with two Jews here being burned at a stake. And that was the beginning of uh, the Rindfleisch persecutions in 12. 98, in the summer of 1298. And what happens then, the town after town in Franconia, these people come and riot, Rindfleisch often with them, and Rindfleisch turns himself into a king. The chronicle speaks of, speak of King Rindfleisch, König Rindfleisch, and he makes mock trials. The Jews don't want to get baptized, so he puts up on the marketplace in the city, he puts up a mock trial and sits there like a king and tries these Jews to be executed on the stake, which means that in Würzburg, 734 people found their death on the stake, and in Nuremberg and in Rothenburg, uh, Meir, uh, Meir Ben Baruch's brother, for example, was one of the victims. And this goes town after town in the whole region of Franconia and Thuringia, and gate gets actually dangerously close to Worms. So here are the Jews of Worms. They have family members, you know, Rabbi Meir, for example. They, they, uh, 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 and, 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 and their descendants. They have family members who are affected, who are the victims. And they think, you know, this can also happen to us at some point. Now this is over, but at some point. So what I believe here is actually that uh, the choice of this image that is not mentioned, the story is not mentioned in the Piyut. The Piyut speaks about the binding of Isaac, which is all about faith, of course. You know, what's more about faith than the binding of Isaac? But no, they show the story, Abraham in the stake, and of course there's a whole theology behind it that also has to do with persecution in the Middle Ages about uh, if you are willing to die for God, um, you will be saved. You will not be saved in real life, like Abraham was saved, but you will save uh, at the end of time um, um, and when the, when the redemption will come. So in the end, you will get uh, the redemption for your, for your, for your steadfast uh, um, belief. So in very short, this is uh, another type, another kind of image. It's less theological, it's less ritual, uh, but it gives you a sense of how these people, you know, those who commissioned these books and those who made them and those who used them actually communicate, mediate things of the day, themes of the day. They, you know, they, they put here on parchment what, what, what kept them busy, what bothered them, what, what, uh, what occupied them, uh, whether this is, you know, high scholarly uh, issues or, you know, a troublesome history just next door a few years back. And I think that image shows you uh, also this approach. So this is just three examples out of several that I could talk about uh, that shows you how we can actually contextualize these images in the life of those who made them, who commissioned them, who paid for them, and who used them, and who looked at them. So now you have still some time for questions, and I thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I um, have maybe, well, a strange question, but it refers to this image and also the previous image about Shavuot. Why do we read the images from left to right? Huh, yeah, good question. Um, no, well, the, the, the one at Shavuot is different, of course, because it's, it's not from left to right, because the important thing starts here. So I, it's not from, it's, I, I'm not good with left and right. It's not from left to right, it's from right to left, because it starts actually here. This is the beginning of the 
field. And here you actually, you don't read it from, from left to right, you read it from the middle, what you often do in medieval art, you know? And, and it's a narrative, so it, it develops here, and then here it's kind of a circular narrative. Abraham, frankly, I, I don't know. Um, such a narrative doesn't have really to be read as, you know, a consecutive um, story. The people knew the story. Um, and it could well be that the important thing from the point of view of the belief is at the right side where it would be started to be read uh, and not, you know, as like a comics from, from one reading, from one um, side to the other. But I don't have a better answer than that. Um, I have a question about the commissioning the book. You yeah. said that uh, the commissioner chose the images that were like related to current events. How detailed were his orders when he ordered a book to an artist? Did he choose all the pictures? Did he choose the main ones? How how did this work? Did he know. really yeah. like everyone was chosen by a commissioner or? Well, that's a question of perspective. Um, I believe they did. I mean, we don't know. First of all, we don't know because there's no documentation. There is sometimes uh, when we have a colophon that is a signature at the end of the book that says, gives us some information about it, um, they will tell us who he was, but that doesn't help a lot. Uh, that doesn't tell us what he told the people to do. Um, I, I believe, but that is, that, that's belief, you know, I, I can't prove it. Um, but I believe, you know, looking, looking exactly at these attempts of, of embedding or anchoring these images within the life of the people, the lives of the people who, who use them, um, somebody really thought about them. Well, I mean, somebody really had a concept. Now, the somebody who had this concept paid for it. I mean, these people use a lot of effort. They used a lot of, of, of money. I mean, it's all about money in the end. And they wanted to be as, you know, they wanted to be as they wanted it to be. And we know this also from Christian, uh, from Christian context, when, um, especially in the 13th century and the 14th century, um, the most, you know, the most fabulous patrons were kings. And they pretty much knew what they wanted to be there. I mean, they had political issues, and you can see them. They had sometimes, you know, sometimes uh, an abbot will commission a book, and he has theological agendas. I mean, you can read the agendas when you, when you try to read, you know, deep into, into the imagery, then you can actually figure out what the agendas were, and then you often figure out, okay, this is a political agenda, this is a theological agenda. So somebody has thought about these agendas. Well, the artist is different in the Middle Ages. The artist is not like the, the genius artist of the Renaissance. That's a different, they are anonymous for most of the time. We, we know very little names, and this, is, this applies to Christians and the Jews um, uh, to the same degree. Um, and for all we know is that the medieval artist, he works for God. You know, he's, he's, a, he's a humble man who works for God, who has a skill, and he learned something, um, but, but he's not a Michelangelo. He's not somebody who, you know, they didn't even sign their, their, their work. It's all for, for God and for the bit of money they get when they work for a whole year or two on such a piece. Yeah. Uh, I have a brief question about the function of the river in this ritual. Yeah. Can you just explain what, well, yeah, what, what was the... It, because it, it was not in the that's Lazar right. of work. Yeah, Elazar of course, does not speak of it. Other sources do. It's just the end, they finish the, the, it's like something, you know, it's not exactly an immersion ritual, like, uh, like, like mikve or something, but uh, it's, it's, um, it's, it's because, and one of the sources, I think it's in the Marzor Vitri, if I'm not mistaken, um, and there's an, a third uh, source that speaks about it, uh, and they say it's just because the Torah is pure. 
the, pure, the water is, I mean, the Torah is pure like water, and in these days, water was pure, so not now, but then. Um, and I have a question about the illuminators uh, themselves, yeah. who they were, where they uh, were studying their art, were there any workshop, workshops or famous schools, I don't know, of producing yeah. books, and uh, were they, I don't know, students of rabbi or something? We don't know. We Nothing. simply, <laughs> we don't, well, we, we don't, we don't uh, you know, yesterday I, I mentioned briefly that we have some names. We have some names. Now, sometimes we have a name, but that doesn't help much because, you know, we don't know who the person was. There is one of them in uh, Navarra, in Navarra, uh, Joshua uh, ben Abraham ibn Gaon, um, who was a masturbator, first of all, that he knew Masora, that he had to be some, he had to have some scholarly education. Um, his brother was a rabbi, his brother was Shemtov, and he, he also authored books. Yeshua Imgon did not author books. They may have been uh, the sons of a rabbi, so that's all I know. And he loves to paint. Uh, others we just don't know. We don't have any information about them. Now we know about, and we know how Christian artists were trained. They were usually trained by apprenticeship. They would go to some workshop very young at the age of 14, 15, 16. And then they would just learn how to, you know, mix the colors and do whatever they did. And all we can think, well, all we can assume is that in, uh, within the Jewish context, this was pretty much the same. There are no famous schools. I, I can't tell you, you know, this is the school of Worms, uh, Jewish illuminators. There's no such thing. Um, if there were workshops, they were smaller. There were no, you know, there were certainly not like monastery scriptoria, which are, you know, big institutions. Um, there were probably homely workshops. Probably just one person and an apprentice, so you know, does mix the, the colors and then eventually learn some stuff. Um, but this is all guesses because we have no documentation about it. There's one text from Portugal that speaks about how to prepare colors, but that's also not very helpful. I mean, we know that they were at least thinking of how to make colors, so they had learned it somewhere, but we don't know. Yes. Yes, it, it's, in, uh, it's written by Jews. It's, it's in Portuguese, but it's written by Jews, yeah. Visual style, um, very similar to how Bible were illustrated and how they were able to, is it possible that Jew artists were, um, have a chance to make a copy from Bible yes. painting because it's really, really you mean similar. From Christian Bibles? Yeah. Yes, you're right. You're definitely right. I mean, yes, it is. It is in terms of style and very often in terms of imagery. Uh, these, uh, these illustrations are often very similar to, um, and I could talk a lot about this. You know, in the old days, uh, people thought, for example, that um, Jews very often had collaterals. They would receive Bibles or any sort of manuscripts um, if, uh, yeah, for for money for uh, money lending security. So, but I don't believe this. I mean, first of all, not everybody got a rich, a beautiful liturgical manuscript as a collateral. Um, what I believe, and actually, I think that's also uh, most art historians believe today, is that any illus illuminator worked with you know model books, motive collections, you know, some sort of file with drawings and they could get them from Christians, but they were not actual actual manuscripts. I mean, just imagine such a workshop. It's, it's, it's a dirty place. There's a lot of color. There's a lot of mess around it. And you wouldn't put there a very expensive Bible to be copied, you know, and then somebody, you know, just sprinkles some color on it and, and you know, a glass of water, or I don't know what. I mean, this is not an environment that you really want to fancy uh, Bible, you know, very expensive Bible. Yeah. And I think they just exchange them. They would do probably, they would, uh, yeah, it's okay. Uh, they would probably buy them. They would get them. And they had no sacred, they had no, you know, there was no sanctity in such an, such an image. That was just working stuff. It was, it was uh, tools. Uh, can you say a few words about the history of this book? Uh, 
Uh, was it uh, all the time in the Worms community? Yeah. Or? No, 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 it wasn't. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, very briefly, no, it wasn't. Uh, 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 proudly, I can say I found out that it was from Worms because it was supposed to be, uh, it was believed to be from, from the Upper Rhine region and I, I studied the right and it is the right of Worms. So, you know, that, that's all news. Um, it then ended up, I'll start you know, from its later history, and then I'll go back. It then, it ended up in the, four, in, the, in the 16th century, it's in Poland. It's in Poland, why do we know this? Because it has annotations at the margins that say, here we don't say this and that piut, we say some other piuts, and these are all Polish, uh, this, these point to the Polish right. So it is um, between the 16th and the 17th centuries in Poland, and then it ends, ends up in the Leipzig, uh, library, which was not always the university library, but it was actually the local, uh, you know, ducal library. And they got hold of it, um, they bought it somehow. I mean, often these manuscripts um, became then the property of Christian Hebraists, or, you know, or, you know there is some pogrom and, and the Jews leave and leave the books behind. And then there is some Christian interest in such books. So since the 17th century, it was in Leipzig and it stay, it's still there. Um, Worms, probably what I think is that there was um, a pogrom in Worms in 1615. And it is possible that it was that, that the community of Worms, I mean, the there was no formal expulsion, but that uh, some of the people left with the book and, and, and uh, immigrated to Poland, and then it was there for until it ended up in Leipzig. That's all I know, but um, yeah. Um, Thank you.